Hey, everybody. It's so great to see so many of you here. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Cheers. Yeah, there, the chairs are in the room. Um, so good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Sanjay Jolly. I direct the program on law and political economy here at Harvard Law School. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our first installment in the series, Supply Chain Capitalism, Legal Regimes and Worker Power, co-sponsored by the Center for Labor and Justice Economy. Uh, big thanks, by the way, to, to Thea, Giovanni, and Noah for, for arranging lunch today. Um, so this series actually has its genesis in a conversation we had last fall with today's presenter, Hila Shamir. We took as our starting point the centrality of global supply chains, that is, of integrated cross-territorial patterns of production to contemporary capitalism, which in turn raised interesting and we think very significant questions about the legal regimes that construct and govern today's dominant logics of capitalist production, as well as how that legal ordering structures power in the global political economy. Power across complex institutional arrangements between North and South and between capital and labor. There is really no better person to kick off that conversation today than Hila Shamir. Next Wednesday, we will host the tremendous scholar and documentary filmmaker Vivian Price. Uh, on March 20th, we have international trade scholar Desiree Clerk. And on April 10th, we are joined by the brilliant Indian trade unionist Chandan Kumar. Hila's presentation today is entitled A New Labor Law for Supply Chain Capitalism. She will be in conversation with HLS doctoral student Nita Karivchi. Um, toward the end of the hour, we will open up the conversation to audience questions, both here um, and from those tuning in on Zoom. So, Nita, please take it away. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Also, use the mic. Um, so, by way of brief introduction, Professor Hilo Shimir is a professor of law at um, Tel Aviv University and a visiting professor at HLS. Um, she's teaching and researching in the fields of labor and employment law, immigration, welfare law, and gender equality. Um, she earned her SJD and LLM from Harvard Law School here and LLB from Tel Aviv University. Um, Professor Shemri's research has appeared in leading academic publications, she has won various awards, and has audited multiple institutions. Um, and the topic of the talk today is about a new labor law for the global value chain economy, which is a recent European Research Council grant project she has been working on. We will be introduced to the supply and chain capitalism framework, what it entails, and how the various issues workers experience can be mitigated by rethinking labor law. Um, afterwards, I will be asking a few questions as a moderator, and then we're going to have an audience Q&A. So, so thank you so much. Can you hear me? Is this okay? I'm thrilled to see all of you here. So, uh, as uh, Nida kindly introduced me, my name is Hila Shamir. I'm a visiting professor here at this year. I'm teaching a class on gender and political economy, and I'm glad to see some of my students here. So thank you for coming. Um, and today, I'm going to introduce you to a research project I have been engaging in, but in some ways, I'm also just embarking on. So I really look forward to your comments and your thoughts about this about the misfit between the current structures of labor law and the current modes of supply and production and capital ownership kind of called together um, supply chain and capitalism. Um, so first of all, I really want to thank um, Sanjay and Yochai and Ben and Sharon and Yuri uh, from LPE and the Center for Labor and Adjust Economy uh, for uh, accommodating this topic, have given it such a, a big, big uh, place in the in the LPE and CJLE um, uh, programming for this term. And um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present to you. Um, this is my new logo. I'm not sure I like. I love it yet. I'm trying it on you uh, for the new project Change Lab. I don't know. Not sure about the name. Um, labor law for a global value chain uh, economy. My starting point for this whole project, and this is just in my eye, I'm kind of wondering where I should stand so it won't. Um, I'll stand over there, sorry. So, um, uh, my starting point for this research is the widely agreed upon fact that labor law, and here by labor law, you know, I really mean collective bargaining law is gradually protecting less and less of the world workers. Changes in the structures of work, the structure of capital, and modes of supply and production 
lead to this misfit between the distribution of market power and current labor law, creating barriers for workers who seek to organize for collective representation or to enforce basic workplace rights. The result has been deteriorating wages and working conditions, health hazards for many workers in the developing and the developed world, but it's not so straightforward because supply chain capitalism also brings with it significant prosperity. So it's not a, a one-sided story here. Um, but what we, what we do know is that there is a real challenge of governance. And this challenge of governance comes both from um, the regulation of, of, of uh, so kind of corporate governance and from labor law. So the failure comes from both places, but I'm going to try and argue to you today that really while the world has been focused on corporate social responsibility, human rights due diligence, the regulation of the way corporations are handling their supply chains, that all of this will not suffice if we don't do a parallel or maybe not a parallel, totally different uh, mode of, of, of change in relation to workers organizing power. So what am I talking about? <coughs> so first of all, I'm using the term supply chain capitalism. I'm using here Anat Singh's term. Uh, it refers to commodity chains based on subcontracting, outsourcing, and allied arrangements in which the autonomy of component enterprises is legally established even as enterprises are disciplined within the chain as a whole. Supply chain capitalism tries to tell us that capitalism as we know it, as we thought we knew it from the Fordist era, those of us who are working in labor law are very well acquainted with it, when we have a situation in which, so in which corporations um, own uh, uh, and make their products to a situation where they buy a lot of the components. So in legal terms, we move to a regime of property, to a regime of contracts, and um, uh, in the supply chain. And this really changes a lot of the assumptions in labor law. So I'm trying to use this framework of supply chain capitalism. Another kind of terminology and world of literature that I'm using is related to global value chains. So there's a lot of terminology around this. Some, some call it global supply chains, production network. Each one of these has its own philosophy. I'm using global value chains because I am interested in focusing on the idea of value and how it's redistributed and distributed along the chain. Okay, and the idea that value is being produced in various points of the chain and the question that is of great interest to me is the question of value distribution along the chain. But I'm not married to this concept, it's just something that I use. The problem we are facing at the moment, therefore, I want to argue, is that labor law that imagined this world in which corporations make rather than buy the goods they produce and the lead firm, has turned labor law into a zombie category. By zombie category, here I'm using Ulrich Beck, I mean an idea that lives on even though the reality to which it corresponds is dead. We still use legal categories and legal imagination that still fits some, uh, some, uh, some very important employment relations. My idea is not that we need to overhaul labor law. It's that we just that we need to expand it, to adapt to the new patterns of, uh, of, of capital supply production and, and ownership. To adapt labor law, I suggest that we are in need of new legal structures to support workers' ability to um, operate collectively, make their voices heard in the workplace, and receive a greater share of the profits. Now, while there's been a lot of call for union revitalization, um, I think we need a parallel call for uh, a kind of labor law revitalization, restructuring labor law for supply chain capitalism. Um, so uh, let me explain a little bit about why there is this uh, mismatch, although it may be uh, quite clear to many of you. So the traditional and lingering premise of labor law is based on a dyadic employer-employee uh, relationship structure. In other words, the employer is the owner of capital, and, their, and therefore workers can exert collective power and improve their working conditions through negotiation and collective action vis-a-vis -vis 
their employer. Yet under supply chain capitalism, these structures and legal tools became for workers in, in GVCs and global value chains the zombie categories. Today, the dyadic employer-employee structure is no longer the relevant unit for many workers' struggle because the employer is often a link in a global value chain led by a multinational corporation uh, that has the power to control key elements of the work despite being legally distanced from the workers. Accordingly, negotiating with, striking against the direct employer may turn out to be a meaningless endeavor because the lead firm may respond by terminating supplier contract. Despite these changes, the broadest structures of collective bargaining law have not changed, making labor laws protections inaccessible to hundreds of millions of GBC workers worldwide. Now, currently, the global efforts to address this mismatch um, and to address workers' rights in GVCs uh, have been focused on the lead firm. So we see transparency legislation requiring corporations to be transparent about their efforts to improve workers' rights, or what are they doing in relation to workers' rights in their global supply chains in the UK, in Australia, here in the US and California. We have human rights due diligence legislation, or corporate sustainability due diligence directive that has just been stalled in the EU this Friday. Again, trying to uh, ask corporations to take more responsibility and to, begin, to develop a process of corporate governance about how they're dealing with these concerns in their supply chains. Of course, we have corporate social responsibility. I should have started with that. So we have all of that that is going on. But, my, but so far, we know that all of this is not enough. It's, it, it didn't, we have at least, you know, some would say more, but at least 35 years of this, and all the research in this field shows that sometimes it works, but mostly it doesn't. And the history of labor law sh should tell us that this is not a surprise, right? Corporations rarely, just out of their goodwill, redistribute to workers, right? We needed a lot of workers' struggle, strife, and fights in order to develop labor law as we know it today and, and to develop uh, uh, collective bargaining and workers' collective power. And so my argument is that what we need to rethink now is labor law. We need to adapt labor law to these new patterns of supply chain capitalism. It's not necessarily easy. This is not a program that I can think can be implemented tomorrow. Right, But I think we need programmatic thinking, and this is something that we have the luxury of doing in academia. At the same time, there are countless of attempts on the ground to improve workers' rights in global value chains. There's so much activism in this field. Um, and the goal of this project is really to learn from uh, these different um, attempts on the ground, and I'll talk about that more in a second. So, a new labor law will look a little different. What I'm using here as another kind of theoretical framework is the power resources analysis. Um, let me just see where I am. The basic um, assumption here again is that the, the architecture of rights and powers imagines uh, that imagine the a dyadic employer employee relationship um, brought with it a regulatory structure that provided workers with different power resources under current labor law. But that what's happened under supply chain capitalism is that all these power resources have been undermined significantly. So what are power resources? Um, when we think about labor power, there's a body of lit literature that analyzes labor power and widely the power of social movements, so it doesn't have to be just labor, uh, through, which, through what is called uh, a power resources analysis. The power resources analysis is founded on a basic assumption that workers acting collectively can successfully defend their interests by mobilizing different types of power. Now, this literature identifies four main types of power resources. I'll go over them quickly. One is structural power. This is basically workers' economic power. A single person can have structural power if they have they come a lot uh, with a lot to the bargaining table. Um, so, structural power really rests 
on, on uh, one's economic position in the system. So, you know, if you have a, collect, a union in a monopolistic industry, they will have more power, that's their economic power, and that's their structural power. And the structural power really rests on the power to cause disruption, disruptive power that um, workers have. The second um, type is, sorry, is associational power. And this arises from workers um, uniting to form collective political or trade union associations. So this pulls the primary power of employees and can even compensate for a lack of structural power, of course, without uh, fully replacing it. Um, now, in contrast to structural power, this requires an organizational process to take place and collective actors to emerge uh, who are capable of producing and ex executing strategies. So this is our structural power and associational power. Institutional power is what uh, a lot of us here as lawyers and me as a labor lawyer are mostly focused on. Institutional power is the type of power that stands at, uh, at the heart of labor law because it stems from the worker's ability to secure influence within institutions. The power is often manifest in labor law because new institutions usually arise at the end of cycles of labor unrest and were implemented uh, and are implemented when capital is dependent on the labor movement's willing, willingness to cooperate. As a result, uh, institutional power is often a double-edged sword because it has this twofold nature. Um, it may grant trade unions rights, at the same time it restricts unions' power to act because it's always the result of compromise. The fourth uh, power resource is societal power which describes workers' coalitions and discursive power. And this may be available to precarious workers because it really depends on the power of their narrative, a narrative about justice, and their ability to team up with other actors. In this context that we're talking about, it's mostly consumers, but it's social groups, organizations, and parties, and harness the power in relation to distributive questions. So what I would like to suggest is that what happened under supply chain capitalism is that the three uh, main modes of uh, power resources, structural, associational, and institutional power has basically been disappeared, been gone by this new, uh, problematic, kind of been problematized by this new structure. So the way labor law works, and, and the way kind of it, it, it is uh, supposed to provide workers with power resources today, is that it that is that it assumes that workers have bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis their employer, right? The employer needs the workers; they need the union. Second, these are repeat players, right? So the em employer can't just say, "I don't care about you guys." He needs the workers in order to produce the goods and in order to continue making money. And so these are repeat players, and so they can't just disregard each other. And third, that we know what the bargaining unit is. Usually the bargaining unit in labor law to which the collective bargaining applies is all the workers who work for a certain employer. Okay? So these are kind of the three assumptions that animate labor law, that create the associational and power resources that we have today. Under supply chain capitalism, each of these has basically gone bankrupt, right? We don't, workers no longer necessarily have bargaining power if the lead firm can just switch to another supplier tomorrow. And, and so they're also not repeat players. That, that way we, lose, we lost our structural power resource and our institutional power resource. And by the fact that we don't have a clear bargaining unit, we are also losing our associational power. Now still, workers can unionize vis-a-vis -a, -vis a supplier, vis-a-vis -vis their direct employer. But their direct employer is a chain, is, is a link in, this, in, in a chain in which he doesn't determine necessarily their, the extent of their working conditions. And there's significant literature about the way lead firms deploy a price squeeze in a way that really impacts workers' working condition, day-to-day -day work, the violence that they're exposed to, the pace of their work. And of course, with technology, we have more and more control by lead firms of, of the way the product is exactly manufactured and what exactly is required to happen. So what is happening under supply chain capitalism is that basically labor lost its power resources, more or less, in, in the context of these types of supply chains. Now, this is not new. This has been something well studied and, and very much at the heart of discourse and the heart of a lot of 
you know, many lawyers make their earning and make their income from trying to deal with this through focusing on the lead firm. So first we had CSR, right? Corporations were afraid that through tort litigation, that some of it was starting to uh, emerge in various places, for the famous one is the Nike litigation, that they're going to be found responsible for the severe violations that are happening down the supply chains. And so they said, wait, wait, we're going to take care of it. Corporate social responsibility, voluntary codes of conduct, soft law. A lot of research shows us that this is basically a form of wash. Uh, and very rarely, corporations actually manage to get these policies, even if they're good, well, kind of well-intentioned, to really do the work to make it um, implemented at the end of the, at the bottom of the supply chain. So it's mostly ineffective. Legislators noticed and they said, okay, so we're gonna require corporations to do something about this because clearly corporations are responsible in some way. We're not gonna say that they're the employers, right? They're not the owners of the factory, but they have some responsibility. And so we're gonna ask them to do all, all those transparency statements and human rights due diligence and corporate sustainability due diligence. And it's been linked with a lot of environmental stuff and environmental regulation that is put on corporations and kind of labor has been laggard behind that a little bit. Um, and the idea was that if we, if we make corporations do all of this, then this will, this will open a way for workers to make direct demands from corporations not around a bargaining table in the union setting, but they can still make demands because they say, wait, your corporate, your, you know, your voluntary code of conduct says this and that, or your human rights due diligence mechanism is supposed to, and, and, and transnational litigation will ensue. So far, all the transnational litigation that occurred in this field has, has either failed, some of it settled, which you know, could be good, but a lot of it has failed on jurisdictional Counts. And there's a lot of research that shows us that we don't have even one single successful one in the field of labor. We have some in an environment. So mostly ineffective. Another uh, kind of issue, kind of an approach that was developed is called WSR, Worker Driven Social Responsibility. This is something that's between CSR and unions, but it's not with unions. The whole idea that these are uh, organizations that are civil society organizations or workers organization, kind of alt labor, that are going to bargain and do supply chain collective bargaining with the lead firm, but the, pro the, the end result is not gonna be a collective agreement, but rather a set of contracts, binding contracts, so it's important, it's not just voluntary stuff that is wishy, but it's gonna be binding contracts uh, that make the uh, lead firm uh, uh, only buy from, uh, from uh, suppliers who commit to a certain set of, of, of uh, to a certain set of standards, and that workers are the ones that develop these standards. Okay, so it's supposed to be grassroots. However, this also proved to be very difficult to scale up and replicate. We have one very good example, uh, the Fair Food Program here in the US, um, in, in, in the tomato fields of Florida, that has done a miraculous job, really just amazing job in improving the working conditions of some of the most abused workers in the agricultural sector in the US. Um, however, the fair food program has, it was difficult to scale up. It moved to a few more produce, but very few, and even in Florida, not to all of them. Um, attempts to do it globally, so the, the fair food program is in tomatoes in the US, it's a domestic supply chain. To move it up to a global supply chain, the, the best example we had was the Bangladesh Accord for Health and Safety that followed the Rana Plaza disaster of 2013, in which uh, 1,100 uh, workers died, thousands were injured. They made this accord that was kind of a WSRE thing, but uh, uh, with the years that passed, we now know that mostly, probably because of uh, uh, the lack of engagement of local actors and the resistance of the Bangladeshi government that felt that these international corporations are coming in and telling it what to do with its workers, there was a lot of local resistance and that also currently is being undermined. So we don't really have a solution. <clears throat> what I want to argue for is therefore that we need to re think labor law. Labor law is a tool we have. It's not a perfect tool. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, 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 sometimes it fails workers miserably, even when it can apply. We know that some of it is 
uh, uh, undemocratic. It, sometimes unions do not represent all workers. We know that there are many, many problems with unions. So I am not trying to glorify unions here. But it's still the best tool we have. It's kind of like democracy. It's imperfect, but the best tool we have in order that and, you know, we may come up with better ones. But so far, it's the best one we have to redistribute back to workers and to collectivize workers' power. And so I want to go back to labor law and ask, what do we need to revitalize and rethink in the institutional structure of labor law in order to make it fit supply chain capitalism? And I want to suggest that we need to rethink five elements. First is the collective agreement. What should a collective agreement look like when it's supposed to, put, to cover a supply chain, when the issue is not one of the dyadic employer-employee relationship. It necessarily means it will have to be multilateral. We'll need suppliers, we'll need firms, we'll need workers, maybe we'll need consumers, but do they have organizations? Are these organizations not fickle? How do we think about representation here? It's global. Do we need representation for local states, for the local authorities? Um, try to provide an answer to that in a second. So what is the collective agreement, this legal instrument, what does it look like and how is it going to be bargained for? Second, who, again, who are the parties it's connected and what's the uh, uh, bargaining unit? That's a really hard question because bargaining units in supply chains, if it's, you know, if I take this phone and I'm going to try and ask about each of the components that, and the work, the labor that went into this from the raw materials, these can be disparate workers spread across the world in very different industries. I think that's not, that's not going to work. I, this can, everyone who worked on this can't be the bargaining unit. So what should it be? We see some uh, attempts to think about more sectoral collective bargaining. So kind of like the Bangladesh Accord, right? Thinking about the garment industry in Bangladesh. There are various attempts to think about how a bargaining unit in a global value chain and what it can look like. Third is the issue of enforcement. We do not have unions if we don't have a strike. I mean, we can have unions if we don't have a strike, but they're not very strong. They're not going to bring a lot of, of a threat to the table when they come to, to, to the bargaining uh, table. And so what are we going to do if the strike is not working anymore? Right, because the lead firm can move. We need to think of other tools of enforcement. Maybe we can think of strikes in specific nodes in the supply chain. So warehouse strikes in the Amazon supply chain is an example. Port strikes. Uh, can be another uh, uh, example. Maybe we can, maybe not in all supply, but why would port workers strike for workers who are making shoes and, uh, you know, this really raises a lot of questions. There are other tools though. They don't, they're not, I mean, everyone who was ever part of a strike knows the power of a strike. It's a really powerful moment of solidarity. I can think of other tools, they don't have that, right? We can think of antitrust and we're not thinking about monopsy, monop, monopsonistic power as a way to regulate it. We can think about trade bans. So Desiree Leclerc is going to come and talk to us about that. That has been one key tool that the US has been using, thinking about its trade power in order to regulate supply chains. I can talk more about that. It's really interesting what's happening there as a tool to empower unions, okay? How well is it working? Desiree will tell us, will engage with it critically. Fourth, international labor unions. What does the union that's going to represent these workers, what is it going to look like? What should it look like? How can we guarantee democracy? How can we guarantee representation? We know again that that has been one of the problems of the Bangladesh Accord. Real issues of representation and democratic participation. Finally, jurisdiction. Right? I told you that transnational litigation has so far failed, mostly on jurisdictional ground. What do we do with jurisdiction? Who is going to arbitrate the conflicts that are going to adjudicate or the conflicts that come out of this? In all of these elements that I'm talking about, there's a lot of experimentation on the ground. There's a lot of people who are trying to think about how to make this work to improve workers' rights in the bottom of, of, of supply chains. However, all of this is happening outside of traditional labor law. And as a result, we see that it fluctuates, that it's not, um, the, 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 that it's not stable solutions, that sometimes it's very specific and unable to, to scale up in any way, that it's not providing us the systemic response that I think we need. And so that's why I think it's time to, to give this project of a new labor law for this moment uh, of supply chain capitalism um, some thought. 
Um, I think, you know, I have an example that I can share with you, but I think I'm going to end there. Um, do I have more? Should, it's such a good example. I know. So let me, okay, I'm going to steal. Do you want to ask me about that? <laughs> you don't ask me about that. So I'm going to now sit down and let's put this back and start a conversation. So thank you uh, very much for your question. Yes, because I think I'm going to use it for, for the surprise question. <laughs> well, it's not too surprised. But um, thank you so much for such a great talk. So I have three questions. And well, actually, the first one is where we're about to go. Yeah. So I was wondering, first of all, like you, whether you could give us a very specific example of a worker category <laughs> or experience, which shows clearly how the law structures the global supply chain, um, what these workers are trying to do about it, and actually how your regulatory approach for reform would apply in that case, and how it would be worked out. We're giving you some more time to discuss this. Um, so let me go back up here so we can see <laughs> the slide. So um, the example that I've been studying, I've been doing uh, a lot of field research in Maharashtra, India, with a union called Hamal Panchayat. Uh, again, Chandan Kumar, who's going to join us at the end of this series, is a, union, is, is a unionizer from that uh, union. And I have been studying their very, very innovative regulatory effort in, uh, and, and success to some extent, I mean, it's not perfect, um, to improve their working conditions. So who are these workers? These are headloaders, sorry, these are, uh, they're called headloaders, but as you can see here, sometimes they just carry stuff on their backs, a lot of it. Um, this is an occupation that one would think should have not existed anymore as such, but because of issues of infrastructure and the cost of labor in India, we still, and actually in various other parts of the Global South, we still see that Matahadis work, it's a really, really hard job, they carry really heavy loads, and they are kind of at the bottom of supply chains everywhere, moving product around, okay, moving goods around. Um, uh, and what they did already in the 60s, really kind of at the in a moment where there was a fear in India, in Maharashtra, in this specific state, that Marxism was going to take over, that socialism is going to, uh, the, the, kind of, the, the Marxist party is going to take over, they tried to calm labor by doing a lot of stuff. So one of it was creating Matadi boards. These are boards that are a tripartite um, with unions, business representatives, and the state. So for anyone who knows anything about corporatism, this is kind of corporatism for the informal economy, right? Um, it's a structure of negotiation in which we have the state and the social partners negotiating. It's particularly interesting because the unions here are not representing employees. Matadi workers are informal workers, so they're not considered employees under, they're kind of like, you know, what we think of Uber drivers uh, 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 under US law. Um, but uh, so, so it's part of the very big 95% of the Indian uh, economy is of informal workers, right? So it's not an anomaly, uh, it's actually the rule. But what is happening there is that they created this uh, structure and they negotiate to, for, to um, create something that is not a collective bargaining agreement because again, these are not workers, but it's, it's a regulatory uh, system for this, uh, uh, um, for this uh, sector that applies throughout the area that, in which it applies. It's very localized, so there are uh, 26 of this, I think 26, I don't remember how much, maybe a little more, throughout Maharashtra, just one state, so it's very, very localized. And the idea is that um, uh, the boards are uh, uh, fully self-funded, so they're not dependent on the state. They're self-funded by fees charged by labor, by labor users. And they also have their own inspectorate system, so their own body of inspectorates. And you now this, you would think, how is this related to global value chain? So what we're trying to do with the actors on the ground in, in, in India is to think about how can we overcome the many problems that we see so far in a private uh, uh, and public labor regulation uh, in this field that is often corporate-led and privatized and non-enforceable, depends on corporate funding or, philanth or philanthropy, and often neo-colonial. So all of the stuff that I told you about, like HRDD and transparency legislation, this is all happening in the global north. 
not really asking the workers in the global south what they think about the whole thing. So we're thinking with them about how to create a structure in which we bring in the lead firms. We bring in buyer representatives, supplier representatives in the world of global value chains into a board structure um, uh, in order to uh, provide a localized solution. So this will have to be very, we, we, we think it needs to be localized and it should involve the state. So again, not, a, not an easy structure um, to, for, uh, uh, for regulation, um, taking that to the scale of the global supply chain. Again, this is an idea. It's not like it was tried out yet. But uh, it's kind of a way to think about regulatory innovation, learning form development of the global, in the global south, where they had so many years of experience with this challenge, and uh, adapting it to the current moment and challenges. Um, and secondly, I was thinking if you could elaborate more about like the current regulatory approaches, particularly in terms of like in the comparative sense with key international players what's happening what the workers are like doing about it but like the strengths and weaknesses of those sort of like comparative approaches such as like the trade bounds you mentioned a little bit what else is there that's going on other than rethinking the law um great thank you so i think you know i um I, I talked about it in relation to, to the methods of enforcement, but I'm, I'm not sure that's the only strategy where it's relevant. But what we see happening around the world are really kind of two approaches. And when I say around the world, I'm talking mostly about the global north that has been preoccupied with this uh, in a way that, again, has been quite exclusionary. And, uh, and, and again, if you come to hear Chantan, he'll tell you about the attempt to make the voices of, the, of, of union actors in the global south heard about these issues and how challenging it actually is. Um, but um, uh, what uh, we see happening are two, two lines of development. So the, in, OECD, in, in OECD countries, so the, the European Union kind of those who study kind of approaches to regulation often has a very different regulation approach regulation than the US in many contexts. And here as well, what they have been really pushing forward has been human rights due diligence. So human rights due diligence is basically an idea that the corporation needs to begin a process in which, in which identifies the risks and addresses them and creates also remedy. The best versions of it, there is also remedy in that system. It puts all the onus on the corporation. The, corp the lead firm is the one that needs to implement it down its supply chain and make sure that its suppliers comply with it. The US has taken a different approach. So the US has taken the approach of trade bans, basically saying we're not going to let a uh, product who have been produced by forced labor, so this mostly focused on forced labor, human trafficking, modern slavery, um, into the US, right? So this is an internal US legislation of the border and customs. Um, and we see that that was mostly a tool used in the, in the trade fights with China, right? To, uh, to ban pro some of the products, especially uh, ones produced by the, the Uyghurs. Um, in areas of China, but, but also we saw it with, with various blood diamonds and there are various other examples in the US. The US have very interestingly used this in the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, the new NAFTA agreement, where there is a very weird mechanism for anyone who knows anything about the US labor law, because what the USMCA says is that if there is a, uh, it established what is called a rapid response the rapid response mechanism is in the case of, you, of, of, freedom of, of violation of freedom of association in Mexico happening in relation to workers who are working in a supply chain that's supposed to go into the US and banning the entrance of goods from factories that violated freedom of association of Mexican workers in Mexico. Okay? So this has been a really interesting. It's a relatively new development. We still don't have many cases in response to that. And, um, and the expert on it is Desiree Clark, who will be with us later, so she can tell us more about it. But these are two very different approaches. I will say the US trade ban uh, doesn't have anything to do with worker voice uh, directly. Uh, however, the USMCA is about freedom of association. So it's attempting to empower unions in Mexico 
though there's a lot of criticism about what kind of unions and in what kind of industry. So there's a whole political economy of what's being banned and why. Um, but uh, uh, but it's, it's really, it's, it's supposed to be worker-centered and it's not really worker-centered in some way. Um, and the European version really has extremely little room for unions at all. Um, so we, uh, with other scholars, we wrote a report trying, trying to think, how can we make HRDD uh, good for laborers, labor and for unions? And it, it, it's not an easy fit, necessarily. So both of these are really not focused on, on unions. Well, having, having mentioned like the weaknesses and the strengths, what I'm wondering is, with regards to the trajectory, uh, what is the likely path we should take for greater success? So should it actually be instead maybe a fundamental human rights law? Is it about international standards? Is it about perhaps domestic contracts and like torts regulation that's going to be more effective? Or can we really achieve this with like a redesign of a collective organize, like a global collective organizing or labor law? So my approach here is clear. <laughs> um, I think that all of it is required. I think it's this kind of a spider web. We need a lot of various attempts to address this challenge, but that none of it will suffice without worker power. I think that worker power eventually here, workers' collective power, workers' ability to make their interests heard uh, is, uh, and, and not just heard, but addressed, um, is is really key for this for, for to, if we want to take seriously an attempt to improve working conditions in that supply chains. And again, I think the example we have is the history of the trade of of, the la of labor, right? The history of labor regulation. And I think about the way labor law is structured today, labor and employment law, right? We have regulation. We have also sometimes criminal laws. Part of you know it can be. Some, some abuse of uh, in the employment relationship is criminal. Sometimes you can have a tort claim that comes out of it, right? We, it, labor and employment law, as is, is a bunch of regulatory tools, right? It's both, uh, it, it's contract and it's regulation, and it's this amazing invention called the collective agreement that is unique to this field. Um, but it tries to do all of it together. And I think in a similar way, we need here to, uh, to develop a system that has all of it, but also has worker power. For myself, I have relatively little belief in human rights on their own doing a lot here. Um, and I think really one of the biggest challenges in this whole scheme is the fact that law is so territorial and capital is not. And so we really need the, the, the challenge here is the issue of territoriality. And human rights could be a language that has already been developed to try to um, create rights in a global context. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we know uh, how weak these can be as well. Well, we can open it up to the audience for Q&A. Are you taking the cure? Oh, should I take? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the um, smartphone as an example of like yeah. it's distributed, but then it also contains a lot of intellectual property, for instance. And it, in some cases, it's the lion's share of the product, the profit that comes from that. So, in a way, the model you, you are discussing. Ex or would aspire to have a way of being exploited better. That's labor law. Yeah, and then uh, there is also another problem that is uh, the property endowments that uh, dominate labor relations and create these two international hierarchies. Uh, do you address this in any way? Do you see a way of addressing this, for instance, through the Mahadi boards or some sort of mobilization mm. or strikes? So my short answer is no. Um, not because it's not important, but just uh, I think it is. And I think, again, as I said, it's a spider web and the global value chains challenge so many legal regimes because of their global nature. Uh, but I'm not focusing on that. So I'm really focusing on workers working at the bottom of supply chains where uh, uh, they're mostly involved in either production work or extraction work or um, you know, or putting together stuff. So that's what I have been 
focusing on, and so I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's a really big question and a really key one, um, and, uh, and, and one that this model, uh, I, I didn't think about how it can address it. Um, maybe it can, we can talk about it more. Tiran, <laughs> um, next you were up. Um, this is the most brilliant presentation I've attended uh, in my three years at this institution. Um, <laughs> I'm weighing my words. Um, but jumping to the point, to clarify the terms labor law, which you keep using to redirect our, our focus for reform, um, and I think it's implied by the last sentence you said before the question. So the problem is law is so territorial. Mm. Whose labor law? What's your theory of jurisdiction? By which, by which I mean social uh, boundaries of legal authority by state sovereignty. And, and is the problem that law is so territorial or something has enabled uh, uh, one or a few uh, quote unquote sovereign states to to um, have near global uh, extraterritorial effect in law you know when the u.s fed federal reserve sneezes uh, and, and it can have repercussions in 50 other jurisdictions or in california state law can can have uh, uh, implications across supply chains that we can't even, you know, hardly empirically trace. Yeah. Um, what's your theory of jurisdiction? And and you use the word neocolonial, but uh, what's what's the word for that type of state sovereignty? Mm. Um, I think that's the biggest question in this project, um, and the way I'm trying to overcome it is through. Uh, thinking about multi-scalar regulation. Um, so it has to be in the local, it has to be in the national, it has to include the lead firm. How do we include the lead firm? Maybe we need HRDD for that. I'm also involved, so the, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, um, has declared probably like maybe 30 or 40 years too late, a new agenda called Decent Work in Global Supply Chains. And they're now working towards an instrument. Do I think the ILO instrument is going to be a solution? No. Has the ILO instrument have ever been a solution to anything? No. But it's another, again, kind of the, this spider web uh, imagery that we have with different tension points. And I, I think we need some international norm, even just uh, uh, you know, for, for activists to use, as, we off, as activists often do, even like the decent work in, in, in domestic work convention for domestic workers could be an example for how the norm itself is so ineffective, but activists have managed to make so much of it in some context. Uh, and so I, my answer here is a multi-scalar approach. I do insist that, uh, uh, that the, the, uh, for this to be realistic in any way, and again, I started by confessing that realism is not the strongest part of this project necessarily, <laughs> but uh, uh, to try at least to, to deal with reality, I think it has to be very local. It has to ad ad be address the fact that law is territorial the way it is. I think it definitely, you know, the, there is a lot, there is a history that I'm not engaged in, but that is told both in the, in, in kind of the twelve tradition of, of, of how to think about international law and how it was created, but also how to think about uh, the whole um, um, nation state construct and how it, that was created. I'm not going all the way there here, but I think in some ways we have to pay attention to that. And so I am therefore very uh, uh, critical of the developments that are happening only in the global north without paying any attention to what's happening in the global south, kind of imagining that Germany on its own can do it with its own parliament. You know, Germany has been one of the only countries that passed, uh, uh, the first country that passed an HRDD, an encompassing HRDD legislation with enforcement power to an entity, an, an, an entity, a pretty powerful entity in the German federal government to enforce it how it just started we don't know how it's going to work but they gave us a template to think about it but it is so focused in the global north 
and the whole process of legislation did not include any other voices. So, you know, I don't think that's the solution. Uh, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm a, a great believer in labor law because it brings unions, it brings grassroots, it, it brings workers' voices, it brings the local necessarily into it. I'm infatuated with the Matadi model because it's so localized. I mean, in one state it has 26 of these. This means that this, whatever we think of, I, I think has to be very connected to the, uh, to, to, to the geography of it into the way law actually applies within that geographical unit. And so that's why I'm, the, the kind of the idea is this multi-scalar arrangement. Is it uh, fail-proof? No. What will make uh, corporations want to join it? That's one of the biggest questions that we're now facing as we're, as we're working with unions on the ground to do it. What are they trying to use? They're using consumers. They're using uh, European human rights due diligence legislation to say, well, look, you have to do something. How about you join a board? You know, that can be your approach to this. This can be your solution. Maybe it'll be cheaper, it'll be more effective. The problem we currently have with these solutions is that they're, although there's a lot of language of transparency, really they lack transparency. Here you'll get more transparency. So there are all sorts of kind of business case to why this can work, but it's, it's not helpful. But, but that's a huge question. Let's do three together. Okay. Um, so one Jackie, and then we can have one there, two. And three. Um, thank you so much. This was amazing, as Tiran said. Just following up on the, um, the uh, just your response about turning to the local, I mm -hmm. completely agree with you. But then I'm also wondering what are the challenges of the local? Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing that you mentioned was a role for the state, um, and also just the assumption that labor law in at the local level is actually something that even unions themselves mm. so how would you address um, the challenge of politics of state um, development um, labor and union making in the global south and do you think there's a role for maybe constitutional law you know there are countries where the right to um, you know picket strike doesn't even exist so I, I just wonder what you think about that and then to the question of jurisdiction, um, do you think there's a role for corporate law um, in that, especially this aspect of lifting the corporate veil? I've seen it maybe sort of work in Kenya, where I'm from, where um, people have been able to sue Uber, and Uber has claimed, oh, we're not your employer. We are, your employer is so and so. We have no relation to you. But the court has been able to say, you know, we can lift the corporate veil and find a relation between Uber and the local drivers. Um, so thank you so much. So we said we'll take a few. Yeah. Let's, who, who is uh, I am from Maharashtra, where you studied the Hama uh, What I'm curious about is the history of Hama Panchayat and how it is closely associated with caste inequalities mm -hmm. in India. And how does your study incorporate them in understanding global supply chains with regard to global inequalities mm. that exist in different ways as compared to the West. Um, so this follows a bit on Tiran and Jackie's uh, uh, questions. I, um, pithily, you could almost identify this as workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Uh, but, uh, yes. but if we close that parenthesis, <laughs> Uh, there's a real question implied in that, which is the global class conflict internal to the working classes in the metropole and in the uh, uh, periphery economies in, the, in different places. The driver is the high mobility of capital relative to labor and the continuous arbitrage between from jurisdictions where labor has succeeded in winning two jurisdictions where it has been weaker. So you have the internal conflicts between successful local uh, successful local efforts like yours, and then the next weakest jurisdiction to which capital can move relatively quickly. In particular, you have the massive redistribution from uh, the, the semi-skilled and skilled working classes of the rich economies to 
both the, the capitalists of the rich economies and of the developing economies and to some extent the rising middle class in um, uh, poorer economies. So the, the locus of effective economic power is where the lead firms are. The locus of potential labor organization is where the lead firms are. They have both as producers and as consumers systematically opposed interests to the global rising working class. How do you think of that, particularly in the context where we're seeing reshoring and nearshoring and industrial policy reemerging as the most obvious, strongest source of changing those dynamics as we see in the chip set? Thing. So somebody, and, uh, and so I'll take one more, and then you can brown it out and nice. ignore whatever questions you want. <laughs> just for briefly, me. on <clears throat> workers unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Um, I was just thinking briefly, and perhaps it was because you started with Onit Singh and um, supply chains and the human condition, where there's almost a tension between your argument and hers, which I heard in a suggestion here is that there's a lot of drive for worker power all over the place but structures that are blocking it. Whereas Singh seems to introduce that with the rise of global supply chains and the explosions of different working conditions and diversity, we also see fewer and fewer workers identifying as workers. You know, she gives the example of the Uber driver imagining themselves as the entrepreneur, the contract chicken producer imagining themselves as an independent farmer. I was just wondering if you buy that sort of premise of hers and how changes to labor law might um, affect and reflect workers' consciousness, vice versa. Thank you. These are all great questions. Um, let's see what I'll do with them. <laughs> um, so I'll start with, with Jackie. Um, so, you know, I think the I, I kind of I constantly go back to the history of labor law and the labor movement, and I think it can't happen without local struggles. And I also, from observing what is happening on the ground, there are a lot of local struggles that are happening. However, there is also a shrinking uh, civil space with uh, in many countries, um, in which there is less and less room for. Uh, uh, for, for being, for making, uh, for kind of making your voice heard if you're against the government, right? So definitely uh, we have to take into account that shrinkles, shrinking civil space. And, uh, and because at the, I think at the end of the day, um, labor movement and any kind of effective worker power is interlinked with some form of democracy. I'm not sure which form exactly, but some form of democratic participation and being able to make an adverse opinion heard. Um, and so I'm very concerned about that. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, and, and I know that increasingly this is something that, um, uh, that this link is something that we definitely have to pay attention to. But I will say that, you know, even for Amazon and then, you know, for many of you here who are from the US, I mean, thinking about Amazon organizing in the US, it has been so hard. We don't need to go to places with allegedly shrinking civil spaces to think about the way structures, existing structures are, are, are creating challenges uh, for unionization. So there's a lot to unpack in this question, you know, even for an Amazon warehouse in Philadelphia, they're trying to change some uh, laws there in order, uh, uh, for some local laws for, in order to even uh, allow for, uh, for for that kind of thing. So I think we're definitely, you know, uh, it's not that I think that the problems only exist also in the global south. I think they exist there, they exist here, um, uh, and that uh, uh, the eventually in some way, as I said, this is it's not necessarily a, prog a program that I can go and implement tomorrow, but it does show us where the sources of power lie and where can we start thinking about mapping these power structures. And these will have to be in the local and it will have to be in places where uh, uh, state power needs uh, to be challenged. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the way legislation is made, right? Struggle over needs, struggle over contest constantly contesting uh, uh, what legal frames uh, we have. So it's not necessarily a satisfactory 
answer. But I think, you know, if you said jurisdictional, constitutional law, yes, I think it's, in some ways it has to be part of it as well. This is not a one size fits all solution. It's kind of a, 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 a blueprint for all sorts of local solutions that we can start thinking about and coming up with. And again, I think unions, um, per, uh, you know, labor law gives us a template to think about this. Okay, so I don't have uh, time to answer. I see the other questions. I see take, people are starting to leave. Minutes. I can take five minutes. Okay, so uh, class and caste. So uh, the Hamal Panchayat is actually, because it's in, in, in uh, Maharashtra, a lot of the workers are actually Marathi, that as you know better than I do, it's kind of a weird caste situation when it's both can be very low, but also a warrior caste. And so they managed to do a lot with this flexibility that they have within the caste system. This is a real challenge, a place we have been seeing. So the caste system generally, as everybody who is thinking about it knows what a real challenge it is for any kind of discussion of equality um, and, and dignity. Um, what, but we do have other examples. So another example is the Dindigal Accord, um, an accord that is uh, happened again in response. A lot of this happened in response to catastrophes. This was the very, very vicious mur murder, rape and murder of a worker in a garment, uh, uh, in a garment factory um, that eventually, uh, where all of the workers are basically lower caste, Dalits, untouchables. Um, and they have created a new accord with this one supplier, who's, by the way, a huge supplier. I kind of talked about suppliers as if they're small, but some suppliers are really, really big. So this is a lot of different brands contracting with one supplier to create, to focus on two things, on gender equality and caste equality in the workplace. Um, it's a really interesting, innovative tool. It has a very interesting story with trade bans that I won't go into because we don't have time. But uh, we do see attempts to deal with the caste system within these frameworks. Again, very challenging, but definitely there is attention that is being paid to it. Um, Yochai, it's, a, it's a, a great question, and I don't have an easy answer for it, right? That there is no easy answer to it. Um, the way I have been thinking about this in order to keep some form of optimism is through um, empirical research is through uh, case studies, is through talking with activists all the time and seeing what they're doing. Because it's not like the proletariat is sitting quietly. <laughs> okay, workers of the world do not, workers of the world are doing a whole lot of stuff all the time and are often failing. Okay, and the idea is to, to um, as as an academic, to lend an ear to their efforts and their successes when they do and their failures in order to do this kind of bottom-up starting theory ground up uh, theory for this so i don't have answers and i think you know capitalism presents us uh, with a with with a real challenge here <laughs> it's, it's just uh, the way it is so i don't have a good answer for that um, the last question, and I think I'll just say, um, you know, we see Uber workers organizing, we see all of these attempts in regulation, so I disagree with Anna Tsing in this. I think she got a lot of it right, but uh, I actually think in these contexts of production that I'm seeing, it's not where we see entrepreneurialization. Matadi is, it actually has a very interesting story, and they, so it's, it's, it's actually, as I'm thinking about it, it's more complicated, but generally I don't buy her full story, and I do think that uh, class politics and class consciousness is on the horizon for many of these workers. Please join me in thanking you. So we hope to catch many of you next Wednesday, same place, same time, with Vivian Price. Thank you. Moderated by Jack. <laughs>